10, and we're going to talk about, uh, when I was trying to come up with the title, and we were, we were going back and forth uh, with Kenny, we thought, we thought about the warfare of the kingdom, but that's what it's going to be about. Every kingdom, uh, and, and God's kingdom is no different, every kingdom has enemies. The very idea of a rulership means that there are going to be some that are going to reject that rule. There's going to be some that are antagonistic to the rule. They're going to fight against the rule. And in this case, you know full well there is another entity out there that the Bible depicts us as the Satan, the adversary. Uh, that depicts him as the devil, the one who is constantly accusing constantly trying to deceive, constantly trying to attack and undo everything that God has, has, has built and would try to destroy every last single soul that God has saved. If he has the world under his thumb out there, there's not a whole lot he has to do to keep that on, you know, ongoing. There, he, there he is. Where is he going to spend most of his time? He's going to spend most of his time trying to wreck the kingdom of God. He's going to do everything he can. He's like a, to me, I would think of a flay, flailing, uh, wounded, severely dangerous kind of animal that knows he is defeated. Knows that what happened at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has spelled the end. They're, they're not under any delusion when the demons... Uh, that possessed people in the first century, many times they would say something like uh, to Jesus, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, have you come to torment us before the time? I'm going to tell you, they're not under any kind of delusion of what's going to happen to them. They know that hell has been prepared, as God said, for the, the devil and his angels. The only reason that you and I will be a part of that is if we choose to share in that. If we choose to be rebellious against God. And so let's begin then in Ephesians, uh, the sixth chapter at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Uh, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To the end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. I'm going to tell you what the Apostle Paul is doing here is, is picturing the, the, the legionnaire, the Roman legionnaire. He's, he's taking different pieces of their equipment and he's attaching some spiritual significance of that, something that is vital in the fight that we render uh, against this foe that we fight. He says we stand, as verse uh, uh, 12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle's not the kind of battles that are fought by our armed forces against ISIS or in Af Afghanistan against the Taliban or in, in past conflicts. Our, our battle is a great battle, a great war, but it's against the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places to undo the schemes of the devil that would try to defeat everything that is good. That is our battle. Now there's a lesson in here, obviously, that actually multiple lessons that we could do about the legionnaire and all of these things that represent the different parts of his armor. But what I'm interested in is sometimes when you read a text, or really every time we read a text, we ought to record our what recur again and again. Or is there a word that comes back and, and it just comes back and it comes back? I want you to notice what word it is in this text. Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
And then if you drop down to verse uh, 13, he says, Therefore take up the whole armor that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Verse 14. Stand therefore. I'll tell you, when you bark those words and you come down through the text, you have what it is that we need to focus on. And that's what I want to do tonight. I want to think about what it means that each day I will stand. We've heard lessons already by all of these men, but particularly I think of what David has done this week and, and, and also Jeff and when they picture the culture that's out there and how we're not in the same culture and how we're fighting uh, for the lives of our children. We think about, you and I grew, grew up in, in Mayberry RFD. We grew up in people that valued the Bible. I, I got up at school. Every morning we said over the intercom, the, the, I, the superintendent, I went to a really small school. I had 14 people in my graduating class. Try that on, guys. You can always say you were 14th in your graduating class. Everybody thinks you're brilliant. And you would flip Flip that switch in front of that speaker and you would take a Bible and you get real close to it and you'd read that verse. And the, kid, you know, the guys always thought it was funny. Jesus wept. That's all they'd read. And they'd go away. They didn't know what they were saying. They were saying a lot. But when, I, when it was my turn, man, I'd pick a good passage. I thought, you know, I'd pick several verses. We read the Bible on the intercom to start the day even before we said the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, I remember those days. That's the culture I grew up in too. But the battle that has been waged, Satan has won. He's taken a lot of territory. He's taken a lot of things away. And if we are not careful, he will succeed, even with us. So that the Bible says we better take him very seriously. The word stand here that's used in this text, Thayer says it means to cause or to make to stand, to make firm, to fix, to establish. Uh, it, it goes on to say that a person or, or, or thing keeps his place or its place. Art and Gingrich says to stand firm, to hold one's ground. What a, what a military idea. The, the legionnaires' boots were not built for retreat. They were not built for really running. They were built for fighting. They had on the bottom what we would call hobnails, uh, think of cleats, that when they would lock their shields together, and you've seen that thing, sometimes they did the tortoise to protect themselves from uh, darts that were thrown from above or rocks. Uh, but when they would lock their shields, those boots were meant, they were not going to go back and repurchase ground they gained. But as they would push forward together and stab through with those short swords that they had, they effectively knew what they were doing. Those boots were meant to hold ground, stand firm. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is picturing here. I'm going to tell you, Scripture is telling to us that there are two great forces. The God who is the creator of all beings, including Satan. God who is the creator of all beings beings, heavenly beings and those upon the earth. He knows uh, how to win the battle. And that battle or war really has been won by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's yet more to play out. When you think about what you and I are meant to be and to do, we have to fight with everything that's inside of us. Everything. And so how do we do that? How do we stand? What do we need to be able to stand? Tonight what I want to do is go back probably mostly into the Old Testament and look at warriors and uh, the Old Testament and what God did through them and what God sometimes said to them. And I'm going to think there are lessons there that you and I need to pay attention to. Turn back with me if you will first of all to Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1 you remember that Joshua is about to enter with the people in the land of Canaan. You remember that he had seen a man with a sword drawn in his hand and he went to him and he said, Are you for us or for our enemies? He said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord have I now come. And then he has those same words spoken to him that were spoken by to Moses out of the burning bush. Take off your sandals because the ground you stand on is holy. This is not an angel. This is God that has come in a manifestation of a human being. And that person that is there is demanding worship, demanding that this is a holy place that you stand. I'm going to tell you, Joshua is going to be given great encouragement. 
He's not only had the mantle of Moses passed on to him. God says to him in this passage in, in chapter 1 of Joshua, begin with me at verse 5. God is speaking to him, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit this land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according According to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Does that sound like the strangest thing that has ever been said to a general that's about to lead an army into battle? Most generals are going to be concerned about what? Strategy. Be concerned about their supply line. They're concerned about all the logistics that have to go into to making sure that the army doesn't get out in front too far, the conquering too fast. You remember the movie Patton when it has Patton going so fast that they have to pull him back because he's stretching the supply line to the breaking point and the enemy could slip in behind and cut them off. I mean, those are the kinds of things that generals are going to be concerned about, about looking at the maps and thinking about the best way, attacking these places first and, and maybe dividing the, the, the country into two, which is what Joshua ends up doing. But I'm going to tell you, that's not God's concern. That, that's already done. That's going to be won. Here's the thing that will spell success for God's people or defeat. You pay attention closely. You follow it with all of your heart and soul and mind. If you don't love God's Word, Satan will beat us. It is imperative the things that David has brought forth so that we can teach our young people to have respect for this book. That these are not just the words of men. They are the very words of God. Even to the tenses of verbs at times that God makes arguments on the basis of whether the word is plural or singular. He is meaning for us to respect it with all of our heart and soul and mind. I'm going to tell you what we need to understand is the same. Our power is not in numbers. It's not the fact that while this is a fairly good sized church and the church that I preach for is fairly good size among uh, non-institutional brethren. A lot of churches have seven, eight, nine, ten thousand, fifteen thousand people. Were they to walk into our number, they would think we are really, really small. It's not numbers that matter. Our success is not measured by how fine the building is. Our success is not measured by the bottom line of, of if there is a board where somebody puts up what the offering is every Sunday. Our success, like Joshua's, is measured upon this. Our love for the truth and our adherence to the commands of God. And just as he said to Joshua, your way will prosper if you pay close attention to this book. And so you and I must do the same. When Jesus was tempted by the, by the Satan, every time, how did he answer him? Every temptation, he said, it is written. When you are tempted to do something, is that the first thing you think about? I'm telling you, the first thing I think about is how weak I am. First thing I think about sometimes is how I want to do that. First thing I think about is not what I ought to think about, what I need to train my mind to think about, what I must reach back in me and find somewhere, and, and pitifully sometimes it's the third or fourth thing that I finally do, where it was the very first thing on the Lord's mind. And then if Satan were to come back and say, well, I know it says that in that text, but over here it says this as if he's trying to make the Scriptures be broken. As if you could pit them against each other. What did he answer? It is also written. That you cannot make Scripture go against Scripture. I had John 10.35 in my notes tonight. 
The scripture cannot be broken. And so what every commander is interested in and what every fighter is interested in is are we prepared to meet Satan? Are we prepared to meet uh, this great foe that we are arrayed against? Listen again to the passage in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. C.S. Lewis wrote a, a book called The Screwtape Letters in which a, an older demon uh, seasoned in his craft of, of tempting and seducing mankind teaches a younger, inexperienced demon how to go about making man fall. I'm going to tell you it's a pretty interesting book. But I'm going to tell you, it's not far off the mark either. What did Paul just say? There are all kinds of, of different words he uses to describe the minions under Satan. The powers that exist to him and his ability to use them and go forth in the world. What does Peter talk about? He goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And yet you and I wake up every day and do, do you think about the fact that Satan has your number and he has my number and he knows what he can tempt me with and he knows if he sets up just the dominoes just right we may not see the danger in each one of those but once he gets them where he wants if he can push it and cause us to be at the right place how many people do you know and I know if I could say I'm a member of this congregation that you know are no longer here they have walked away from God never to serve Him again because that's exactly what Satan did. He rarely comes in one frontal assault with his sword drawn and slays us. But he sets us up. And eventually he succeeds. You know what my problem is? My problem is the same as the little girl who loved chocolate chip cookies and she had a homemade chocolate chip cookie in her hand and she was walking across the kitchen and um, mama was in there and she dropped it accidentally on the floor and her mama had told her a thousand times it has germs on it, pick it up, go throw it in the trash, come get another one. Well this time she'd had it. She picked the cookie up, she stomped her foot on the ground and she said, germs, Jesus, and the devil are all I ever hear about around here and I've never seen a one of them. <laughs> and that's my problem. And that's your problem. We can't see Jesus yet. I can't go and shake his hand and embrace him and look him in the eye and hear his voice come to me. Oh, he comes to me, yes, as he does you. We hear him. We can see him. We can be molded to be like God and know God. But the reality is, this system the way he wanted it, and you are and I are in fleshly bodies that can be tempted, that have an eternal spirit made in his image inside of us, and the greatest battle that is fought is not anything against ISIS or the Nazis or against North Korea or whoever else it may be. The greatest battle that is going on in this world is in our eternal spirit that is being fought for between Satan and God. And we had better, though we cannot see either one of them, Believe with all our heart that they exist. How many have failed because they were not prepared? Listen to verse 13 in the New American Standard Version. It says, and having done everything to stand firm. My, my, my wife has been a teacher for many years. And I watch her lay out what she wants to do meticulously. She is very, very concerned about getting it. And most teachers that care about everything, they're there hours after many times, sometimes the door closes. And, and, and preachers that do their, their work well, like David and others, are that kind of way. They're, they're better than I am about stuff like that. They are meticulous in how they lay out everything. I'm going to tell you, it matters, doesn't it? Success in, in probably anything is built upon people that know how to prepare, having done everything 
thinking about everything that we possibly can think about, our prayer life, our, our study of God's Word, our preparing ourselves uh, in not being in places where we don't need to be because we know we're weak and we could fall. Having done everything, then take your stand because you have prepared yourself. Having done, this word in Greek is an emphatic compound verb. It means to affect it by labor, to achieve it by work, to bring it about. Thayer adds this, having gone through every struggle of the fight. So how, just to begin with the beginning, how's your daily Bible reading going? How's mine? I start pretty good in January. And I do a pretty good job through February until I get the flu. And then I'm laid out, and there's a few days in there where it's just you just feel so rotten and you quit maybe praying. And then just about that time, if you're younger, then down where I live, the soccer season starts. And Little League begins. And then business all of a sudden. Something happens and we've got to be gone for a week at a time and we're flying in and we're flying out and, and we're just busy, 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 busy. And, and, and don't you think Satan has done what he has done really well? That he's not gotten us to forsake God. He's not caused us to quit missing the assemblies. He's not even caused us to totally quit reading the Bible. But how well would your body fare if you fed on it, you, you, you ate and fed on physical food exactly like you eat and feed on God's food for our souls? What would our bodies look like if we could carry out that same analogy? If you can read just four pages a day, that's what I do. I just go through and read four pages a day. You will read through the Bible entirely in a year. That's not very hard. That's just a beginning place. The Bible says we need to meditate on what we read. We need to find not only the time to read, but to sit there and think about what we've read. To let it mull over in our mind. Maybe that meditation comes later because the mind has a way of doing stuff with things that later I'll go, man... That's what's going on there. And then that we pray over God's Word and we have time to read it with our families and over and over, are we prepared? Are we doing everything possible to stand? Colossian letter says to us in chapter 4 verse 12 that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Apostle Paul writes to us in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 again our same words, stand firm. And hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. He doesn't mean by traditions here what Roman Catholicism means or other religions that would think of things that are outside the word of God. These were passed down or handed down as, as, as the idea would be. In a day and age when this was not yet completely written, there would be things orally handed down. Paul would give command. As I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. That's in written form. He says that here by our spoken word or by our letter. But lots of it would be handed down to them. And it was the thing that Paul was wanting them to make sure that they stuck to it. This passage has meant a lot to me in the last few years. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. I remember running to it thinking, why haven't I seen this before? Paul says there that you may learn by us, by Apollos and Paul as was a context. Listen to these really important words. Not to go beyond what is written. You want a passage that you can use with anyone that would say, well, the traditions of the second century ought to matter to us and the third century and so forth and so on. The time period after the apostles have passed from the scene, after the New Testament is closed, even those centuries know that there was a difference between these books and the things that were written in those centuries. Folks, it concerns me when young people make light of what has been called sinny 
by that sine, C-E-N-I, command, example, and necessary inference. I'm going to tell you, all of us as gospel preachers and teachers of God's Word need to make sure that we are teaching the present generation that that's how anything teaches. That's how a textbook at a college teaches. That's how you learn from a newspaper. These are not magical things that we've invented. This is how the Bible teaches because that's how anything teaches. And yet I hear people poo-pooing the idea that sin just is, is beneath us and, and we ought not to be concerned about it and it's not that important. And folks, if we let, let ourselves not preach it, not teach it, not emphasize it, then we're going to raise a generation of people that will, what? Create the same problems that were created in the past. That men like Brother Goff had to fight. We need basic, tough kinds of lessons. We need to say over and over again to our young people, look at those words in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Do not go beyond what is written. Because there is our salvation in Him who spoke these words to us. Secondly, every, every soldier had to be alert, don't they? They have to watch. The Roman sentry caught sleeping on duty was punished by death. Why would that be the case? Can you imagine if one went to sleep and they caught him? What if it, they didn't catch him and the enemy was approaching from where he was asleep and then he, that the enemy could destroy the camp or put them in, in, in terrible danger? That's why they would kill the sentry that went to sleep because their whole lives depended. Everybody that was asleep depended upon his alertness, his watchfulness. In 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, verse 13, again, Paul uses imagery that, that just makes you think of a, a soldier. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. The Romans, I am told, did not choose Rome, the, where the city of Rome is, because it was really a really defensible place. Romans chose Rome because of their inner character. And that is that they did not believe walls defended men. They believed men defended walls. And they conquered all of the Mediterranean world and beyond. The Apostle Paul is saying to us that we need to act like men, spiritually. We need to make certain that that is how we are, and not that we are weak, and not that we, that we understand that, that there are going to be times that are tough, even individually and even as a group, that there are things that we have to make certain that we are doing. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Others out in the world are asleep. They haven't woken up to the Lord, awakened to the Lord. We are the Lord's army upon the earth and we can ill afford to go to sleep. That, under, that makes me understand that, that Satan has, as I said to you a moment ago, my number. He knows exactly how I think and what will most appeal to me to sin against God. And he may methodically set up my fall. If I am not careful to watch, and I can never, never go on a vacation from being vigilant and watchful. How many have we known who, have, who because they didn't watch, Satan destroyed? In 1 Corinthians the 10th chapter, verse 12, he says, Therefore let anyone who thinks, who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. I can't look out there and say, well, that passage is for Kenny. That passage is for Jeff. That passage is for Kyle. That passage is for uh, you, whoever, and not me. I need to look at it, most of all, for me. Thirdly, we must be determined because that's going to be the case for everyone who fights in a battle. We must be determined to win. 
Turn back with me, if you will, to 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. 2 Samuel 23 talks about David's mighty men. Now, we're about to read some Hebrew names, and I'm sure I will butcher them. First of all, because I have a southern accent. And secondly, because I am certainly glad that these guys didn't have emails. How would you like to email that name? There are the names, uh, these are the names rather of the mighty men of David. Josheb Bashabeth, a Tachamanite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. Next to him among the three mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohai. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel withdrew. And he arose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the men returned. I want you to listen to that. The men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hererite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. What's the matter with most of us? Most of us are not going to win if we fail. We're not going to win because it costs too much. And it lasted too long. You know what the problem with us in our battle against ISIS is? Exactly that. All the Western powers, with all the Arab nations, they're not willing to have to pay the cost, what it means to take it down. Same thing with North Korea. And if you start that process... The lives that are going to be spent and the cost and the blood and money and everything else and weeping is going to be too long. And so most of the time, just like World War II, we just think, well, let's just hope it goes away. But we cannot win in this battle if we do not have mighty men. I want you to think about who David's men were. The first wielded a spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. It put him in the forefront because he was willing to put his neck out and he was willing to fight. The second man fought so hard that it said the, the sword clung to his hand. You can almost see the idea that they had to come up to him. His hand is weary after he's slain all those and they have to peel back one finger at a time to get the sword out of his hand. And the last guy, all of them flee. They fled on the second guy too. They only returned to strip the slain. He was fighting by himself. Second guy, absolutely by himself. Everybody runs, but he stands and brought about a great victory. How many do you know were on fire when they began their spiritual journey? When you baptize somebody into Christ for the first time, sometimes you look into the eyes of people, and I mean, they want to tell everybody. They start going and talking to their friends. They talk to their parents. They talk to their siblings. They're interested in saving other people. And, and, they, and they stay on fire until somewhere in there they, they learn too much from me. And maybe from you. That we just don't spend the time staying on fire. That we don't think about how great this battle is, what the end result is meant to be. That we're just sort of ho-hum about it all. That it's sort of, it's not, it's not the forefront most important thing to us as it was to David's men to fight the enemies of Israel at that time. And that in the case of David's mighty men, most people run away. That when battles have to be fought spiritually and when people have to stand up, sometimes it's only a very few who will stand. Maybe think of the story of the Marine recruiter who came with the Army and the Navy and the Air Force to high school to try to recruit young people, both uh, guys and gals, to the military, to their respective branches. And each of them, Army, Navy, Air Force made their big speeches and then finally the Marine guy got up and he 
smartly walked up to the microphone and looked around at that crowd and he said, looking at this motley bunch of misfits, I only see two or three of you worthy to me, Marines. See me afterward and just walk back. Who do you think had the biggest crowd? Sometimes, folks, we don't, we don't go forward and we don't conquer and we don't do better because we never challenge not only ourselves but others. We end up doing the same thing the same way. We, we, and I'm not saying those things are wrong, but what I'm trying to say is do, do we do what Jeff was talking about, realize how hard the, the Sermon on the Mount is and how everything that it says to us is a challenge to us. Who died for us? What do we owe Him? And then, I absolutely need the help of you. And you absolutely need my help. Turn over to 2 Samuel, the 10th chapter. This story is the story of Joab. Joab, who was the commander of David's army. In verse 9, it says that they had gone... Uh, against the Ammonites and Joab saw that the battle was set against him both in front and in the rear. He chose some of the best men of Israel and arrayed them against the Syrians. They had been hired as mercenaries to come fight. They were the best soldiers. The rest of his men he put in the charge of Abishai his brother and he arrayed them against the Ammonites. Now listen to him. He said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God and may the Lord do what seems good to Him. <clears throat> How many of us need to say that to each other? If they are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. And if they are too strong for me, you come and help me. But we put on our facades, don't we? What happens when you see somebody come in the front door and you say, how are you doing? And they say to you, I'm not doing well. Well, okay, so you go see Mike Conley. I'll push you over there. Or we come in and we put on our facade, which preachers can do so easily. I have a feeling so can elders and deacons and Bible class teachers and song leaders. And we just yelled at our wife in the car coming. And we just had a big fight at home. But we walk in here and put on our church face. And we act like, I don't need you. To be vulnerable to other people is very, very difficult. If I'm going to help other people, it takes time from my sports and fishing and golfing and hobbies and whatever it is that you like to do to serve other people. Are we willing to pay that price? Are we willing to be humble enough to accept the aid of others? Sometimes people are so private that they will not tell you anything about their life. How are you going to help them if you don't know what they're suffering? Are we willing to be weary in doing good? The one another passages which are all in the Bible, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, admonish one another, encourage one another, have no meaning in the universal church. I realize now we can contact people and yes, we can help people halfway as, as David does with the Italian work and other people do. And can FaceTime as he was the other day on the phone with one of them. I realized that, but when this was written, and when we understand what the meaning of it is, those one another passages are all about a local fellowship. They're all about you and I knowing one another outside of these four walls. Of being invested in each other's lives. Are you active in the work of this local church? Do you serve one another? Bear one another's burdens? If we only come occasionally to services, if we rush out as soon as the amen is said, how can we be members of one another? It takes a lot of hard work to do what Paul says in Philippians 1.27. 27. 
I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side. And so in the end, <coughs> we sum up by saying, every day I must fight against Satan and his forces. I must believe he is as dangerous as the Bible tells us he is. If I was a mail carrier and I went into a yard, I'm going to tell you, I don't like going up to people's houses when I see something like a Doberman or a Rottweiler in the yard. And they don't know me and I don't know them. I'm going to tell you, I keep my eye on that animal. I'm talking to that animal. I'm determining whether or not it's a safe thing to do or not. But that's exactly what the Bible says. We better pay attention to who Satan is. We need to pay attention to who we are, the sin that so easily ensnares us. I can't say that about you. Oh, that, that's just your problem. That's not my problem. That if demons could love this present world and walk away from Paul, so can I. And so can you. That we must fight against anything that would disrupt our unity. I implore you, Odia and Syntyche, to be of the same mind. It is reported to me that there are contentions among you. Paul wrote to the Corinthians. But if you bite and devour one another, not all the one another's are positive. Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Is there somebody in this congregation that you simply are at odds with and you don't speak to each other like you used to because something happened? Pray tell what's going to happen when God comes back. Robert Turner in his stuff about things, told of the bulletin typist who was typing, the church was untied. Untied like you untie a knot. She meant to type, the church was united. Brother Turner then said this, now think carefully, the I was misplaced. The I is always misplaced. Take somebody aside and say to them, and mean it with all your heart and follow through with actions appropriate. My brother or sister, I haven't been what I ought to be toward you. I'm not asking you to do that with everybody. Just one person. I'm going to tell you, you'll see a change. Not only in them, but in you. And finally, and everything's been said by Jeff and, and David especially, we are fighting terrible forces. We must fight and not pretend as if it's not real. Melissa and Aaron Klein were owners of Sweet Cakes in the state of Oregon. You may know this story. A lesbian couple came in and asked them, they, they made wedding cakes to make a wedding cake for their, their marriage. Klein, who was a believer in Jesus, declined and the lesbian couple went to the Department of Justice in Oregon. And they fined the Kleins $135,000. And the couple sued them for emotional, mental, and physical damages for $150,000. And the protest and the lack of business forced the Kleins to close their business on September 1, 2013. You think that can happen right here? What happened Sunday? What happened Sunday in the march downtown here? It's everywhere. If we give in, brothers and sisters, on modesty and social drinking and gambling, pray tell why we would stand up against homosexual marriage and against militant Islam. We, and I include myself in this, are not as strong as we need to be. Cardinal Francis George of the Archdiocese of Chicago, you may have seen this as well. Jeff and I have talked about it. it this came from October 2012. He spoke to a, an assembly of, of uh, as a, as a bishop he, in the Roman Catholic Church to priests. 
He said to them, I expect to die in my bed. I expect my successor will die in prison. I expect his successor will die a martyr in the public square. And I expect his successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization as the church has done so often in human history. I do not borrow that because I believe the Roman Catholic Church is correct, spiritually speaking. I borrow it because I think he is right on the money. His timeline may not be exactly right, but we have lived in very strange times because, folks, we have not been persecuted. <laughs> And we come here and do what we do so easily that what will happen when it becomes bitter and when it becomes tough? The fourth century, there was a theologian named Athanasius who fought against Arianism. Arianism was the belief that Jesus was a created being by God the Father and that he was not of the same substance as the Father. Things that just are totally opposite to what Christianity taught in the first century and what most Christianity has come to believe, including you and me. That Jesus is the Son of the living God, that He is God in the flesh when He came to this earth and that He was not just a man. But in the fourth century, the whole theological world seemed to be against Athanasius, to which his friends were forsaking him and he was being isolated. And finally, one of his friends said to him, Athanasius... The whole world is against you. To which he calmly responded, then is Athanasius against the whole world. And if it must come down to that, stand. Stand firm. And may I do the same where I live. That God's name will be glorified. If you're subject to heaven's invitation this night. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. If we can help you to want to follow him, then we bid you come as together we stand and sing.